Hello, BookTube. I've got some mail for you once again on a Sunday. Once again, there was a ninja mail delivery late at night. I guess these things shouldn't be unexpected anymore. Apparently, I am the last stop uh, for the, what is this, the UPS driver on the weekends, the Saturday UPS driver. Apparently, instead of being his first stop, I'm his last stop on Saturdays. And I should just be ready for that. But I've got a pile of mail to go through here. So we'll, let, let's see what we have. Let's hope for some finished copies for June. That would be nice. <laughs> the, book, the book section editor in me hopes for finished copies for June. Uh, but I'll, of course, be happy to get whatever. What have we got here? Oh my. <laughs> oh my. Q <Cubert> <laughs> This is uh, the folks at New York Review of Books put out a line of New York Review of Books classics. They, they reprint books. And as I mentioned many times on this channel, although I absolutely sing the praises of their endeavor, imagine a well-funded and popular endeavor to bring out affordable paperback copies of older stuff. That is just wonderful. And the stuff they pick is non-canonical. Usually it's non-canonical. You won't, you won't have too much trouble in any year finding some publisher who's willing to bring out a new copy of Pushkin or Dickens. But the New York Review of Books goes far afield. They find a whole bunch of stuff that either hasn't had the print line that they would like or that has been languishing out of print for a long time. And although I sing that's praises, I think that's wonderful. On the other hand, they almost never pick books that I'm interested in. I'd love, actually, in some weird alternate world, I would love to have the people who do the picking. They have an editorial board. I've never actually gone down the names on the board for fear of finding people that I don't like. <laughs> that, that might explain things. But even on an editorial board, as any of you are ever in group meetings or on boards of any kind will know, no matter how big the board is, there's always going to be about three or four people who make the work, who make the decisions and then get them done. Uh, and I'm sure that's true at the New York Review of Books. And I, in an alternate world, I would love to have that those three or four people here at Hyde Cottage for Wine and Calzones just to talk about books. What a conversation that would be because we wouldn't agree on anything <laughs> But uh, I'm on at least one of their mailing lists because I do get their books from time to time. And this latest one is one I approve of. <laughs> and also perfectly timed. It's one I haven't read in a long time. So getting it in the mail is just wonderful. So let's see. This comes out in late May. And this is Reflections of a Non-Political Man by Thomas Mann, uh, the great uh, German writer who left, who fled his homeland rather than be interned and executed by the Nazis. Uh, the author of The Magic Mountain, what I consider to be the, the greatest single novel of the 20th century in any language. And here is, a, this is lovely. Look at how wonderful this is. A broken down piano in a deserted house. That is a great cover choice. This is just, well, let me, let me, let me tell you about it here. This is translated by Walter Morris. Uh, let's see here. When the Great War broke out in August 1914, Thomas Mann stood firmly for the German cause. He resisted any calls for international solidarity. He resisted the claim that Germany, as a burgeoning imperial power and undemocratic monarchy, was on the wrong side of history. Reflections of a Non-Political Man, written in the last years of the war and published in October of 1918, was a patriotic hymn of praise to the German culture over its rivals, a scathing rejection of democracy as a threat to the achievements of the traditional German society, and the necessity of individualist freedom to create great art. He was in direct opposition to his brother Heinrich uh, and many fellow artists and writers of the day. Everything was being politicized, Thomas Mann thought. Everyone was being forced to agree with French ideas and everything was going wrong. Democracy might indeed be leveling. It would reduce the country to the lowest common denominator. Uh, so this is... This is uh, it's a, a, a major work by an author that, uh, and it's a major work by this author that is seldom read, even by his fans. So that is fantastic. To get this. This, is, this is going to come out and be discussed uh, in late May, you know, because it's it's a hundred year old book about a completely outdated politics. But it doesn't matter. It's an eternal author, which means, as I've mentioned before, I've described this process to you before. There are going to be books editors all over the country who are getting this in the mail or who have seen it on the advance, you know, on the listings for this publisher, and thought, well, who do I have who could write about Thomas Mann? Not necessarily just this book, but who could give me a really good piece on Thomas Mann? There are going to be book section editors all over the country who get this, open it in the mail, and have those same thoughts. My own thoughts are, are trending more towards just what fun it will be to read it again after this long. That's fantastic. All right, we're off to a fine start. <laughs> Uh, not only uh, a book I really like, but uh, the New York Review of Books 
coming out with something that I both recognize and approve of. That doesn't happen often. Uh, let's see this next one. It's a finished copy. Oh my. Oh goodness gracious. All right. We were, uh, <laughs> we were queuing uh, Britta Bowler for the last book. Those of you who don't know why, Britta wrote a very good novella about Thomas Mann. Uh, and now we're queuing Alex at what page are you on? Because <laughs> he's one of his literary girlfriends has arrived in the mail. This is Rachel Cusk. This is second place. Gotta love that they're sticking with this cover art for her books because it really works. It's some who, who actually, since I mentioned it, uh, the author photograph is by Simon, Simon Scammell Katz. And the painting is Girl Waiting by Elmer Bischoff from 1959. A detail from Elmer Bischoff's painting, Girl Waiting. Uh, and this has blurbs from everybody, just all over the place. <laughs> because, of course, this author is hugely praised. So let's see what we have here for second glance. Uh, blurbs everywhere. Good Lord. Even that, that Sam Sachs character from the Wall Street Journal. Uh, oh my God, more blurbs. Dwight Garner, are you getting in on the act? And, and yet more blurbs. Okay, so the whole thing is blurbs. Uh, but the book will certainly describe it. It doesn't matter. It's Rachel Cuss, so it, it's going to sell out its original printing. But nevertheless, we, we still want to know what it is, right? A woman invites a famous artist to use her guest house in the remote coastal landscape where she lives with her family. Powerfully drawn to his paintings, she believes his vision might penetrate the mystery at the center of her life. But as a long, dry summer sets in, his provocative presence itself becomes an enigma and disrupts the calm of her secluded household. Second place, Rachel Cuss's electrifying new novel is a study of female fate and male privilege, the geometries of human relationships and the moral questions that animate our lives. It reminds us of art's capability to uplift and to destroy. Yeah, cue Alex. <laughs> Good Lord, this is a book right up his street. Uh, do we know when this comes out? Uh, does this say? Or is this just all, literally all blurbs with no useful information at all? Oh, yeah, this came out uh, on February 2nd. Uh, so, it's not of quite as much interest to me. Uh, it might be of interest to one of you. Uh, it, it's new. It's just not newish new. <laughs> so, let's keep going here. These next two are huge. They're, you could surf on them if you wanted to. Uh, so, maybe they're oversized things. Or multiple things. That would be great. Uh, this, no, this next one is oversized. Uh, what have we got here? Oh my. Oh goodness. Okay, alright. Well, cue one of you. I don't know who it is, but somebody out there is going to want to read this review much more than I am. There's a, there's a fan of this person out there that's much bigger than I am. Uh, this, I can almost remember who it is. One of you has praised Stephen Sondheim endlessly. Is it Juan? Just Juan Reader? who's praised Sondheim and just loves him? I think it might be Juan. I don't know if Juan watches my videos anymore. I'll have to leave a comment on one of his videos just in case, because I'd be happy to send this to him. Uh, this is by James Lapine, and this is Putting It Together, how Stephen Sondheim and I created Sunday in the Park with George. Uh, and it is slightly oversized. This is slightly an odd size here, probably because it's going to have... Yeah, it has lots and lots of pictures. Lots and lots of pictures. And also, oh, neat. That was neat. Oh, let me see if I can find that again. Uh, it's, it not only has pictures of, like, for instance, uh, Sunday at the Idol of Jean, Gra Jean uh, Grandjean, the, the famous painting there. There's a young Mandy Patinkin uh, reading about the show. But it also has uh, photographs of uh, scores and whatnot. Fantastic. That's why it's bigger. And this has got to be very advanced, right? Yeah, this comes out in August. This comes out in August. So what have we got here? I'm thrilled to share a copy of Putting It Together. Now, the author's chronicle of the two-year odyssey behind creating the acclaimed Broadway musical Sunday in the Park with George. In 1982, Lapine, fledging playwright and director, met Stephen Sondheim, 19 years his senior and already a legendary Broadway composer. Inspired by George Chirac's masterwork and A Sunday at La Grande Jatte, uh, the two embarked on an artistic journey to create a new musical that, charged, that changed their careers and lives forever. And although Juan will scream in outrage, it, the show has only one good song. <laughs> the rest of it is just Sondheim nonsense. So he is clearly the reader for this and not me. The, the uh, Ordinary Sunday, uh, the, the showstopper piece that splits the play, the, the sort of literally the showstopper because it brings down the curtain on an act right in the middle of the show, 
is the show's only really great number. And it is terrific. It is amazing. If it is staged right, then it literally, quite literally, brings this painting alive. Uh, and all the people in it. That uh, On an Ordinary Sunday is an, is an amazing song. Uh, oh, but actually, no. Isn't there another good song? It's Hot Up Here is a different song from that, right? It's hot and monotonous. <laughs> the boatman schwitzes. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's see here. I'm not... I'm not Sondheim Speaker's fan. I did go to see Sunday in the Park with George uh, in the 1980s on Broadway many times, but, but I'm not his biggest fan. It is a fun show, though. Absolutely fun. Uh, in effect, to read this, feel, this book feels like sitting after hours at a bar listening to two old friends who also happen to be legends reminisce. Oh my, I have to get in touch with Juan. Pretty sure it's Juan who loves this guy more than I do. He needs to have this book. Uh, and this has blurbs from uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda. Frank Rich, Audra McDonald, and Stephen Colbert. Not a bad lineup of blurbs. Okay, so the, a big illustrated book about uh, the making of Sunday in the Park with George. Interesting. <laughs> interesting. Very interesting. All right, so uh, as usual, you just don't know what a mail haul here on this channel is going to do. Uh, so let's see what this next one is. Another, another huge thing. It could be an oversized thing again. Yeah finished copy of something. Oh, no, it's a, it's a finished copy of something. From one of these, these cardboard things that, uh, that is sticky all over, so you have to sort of control the pieces. I'm keeping one eye cocked on the bean. She's over on the bed, and she's not happy today because the rain is coming and going all day. There's a thread of rain all day. And she doesn't like that at all. <laughs> so, so what have we got here? Oh wow! Okay, great. Okay, this is. I think this is late getting to me. No, this is mid-May. This is mid-May. So this is next month. I've already read this, and it is great. It is absolutely great. If it is the slightest bit of interest to you, you should order. Make sure to reserve it from your library if they're not getting it, or pre-order a copy or something like that. Be, put it on your radar if this is of interest to you because it's fantastic. This is by Anne McCutcheon. And it's called The Life She Wished to Live, a biography of Marjorie Kennan Rawlings, who wrote The Yearling. Uh, and this is amazing. Just an amazing bio. One of the best, I'm sure it will be one of the best biographies of 2021. Uh, and it's, it doesn't look like it's going to have a whole lot. It's got, it looks like it's going to have a whole lot of competition in that regard. But even so, I, I can't recommend it strongly enough. As this comes out on May 11th. Uh, let's see here. And it delivers a comprehensive and engaging portrait of the Pulitzer Prize winning author of a beloved children, uh, classic of American letters. Uh, and I once had the uh, Scribner's Illustrated with the Wyatt illustrations of, of The Yearling. And I don't anymore. When I read the advanced copy of this and I finished with it, I wanted nothing more than to read that book again. And I don't have a copy. I want, I know the copy that I want. I want the, the Scribner's Illustrated with, uh, with A.C. Wyatt illustrations. And I don't have it. Uh, but it will turn up. That the Brattle will provide. Uh, Rawlings was a tough, ambitious, and independent woman who refused the conventions of her early 20th century upbringing. Determined to forge a literary career beyond those limitations, she found her voice in the remote, hardscrabble life of Cross Creek, Florida. There, she purchased a commercial orange grove and discovered a fascinating world out of which to write, and a dialect of the poor, swampland community that the literary world had yet to hear. She employed her sensitive eye, sharp ear for dialogue, and philosophical spirit to bring to life this unknown corner of America in vivid, tender detail, a feat that earned her the Pulitzer Prize in 1938. Her accomplishments came at a price, a failed first marriage, financial instability, a contentious libel suit, alcoholism, <coughs> <coughs> uh, and physical and emotional upheaval. Uh, with intimate access to Rawlings' correspondence and revealed early writings, McCutcheon uncovers a larger-than-life woman who writes passionately and with verve, whose emotions changed on a dime, and who's, who drinks to excess, smokes, swears, and even occasionally joins in on an alligator hunt. The Life She Wished to Live paints a lively portrait of Rawlings and her contemporaries, including legendary editor Maxwell Perkins and her friends Zora Neale Hurston, Ernest Hemingway, and F. Scott Fitzgerald and the Florida landscape and the people that inspired her. And that is McCutcheon's true strength here, is to portray the place. The place is just indelible in the course of this book. So, uh, fantastic. Okay, so I have a finished pr uh, print copy of this. I wasn't really expecting that I would get one. I guess I, I got I lost track of the dates. Uh, but that's great. Fantastic. So, uh, 
So this is this mail haul is turning out to be quite good, <laughs> quite interesting. And then the last thing we'll do here is a box, uh, and it's heavy, so it could be another finished copy. Uh, finished copies are good. Now that I have uh, freelancers to feed, finished copies are good. Uh, oh my! Oh goodness gracious! Okay, another winner of a book. That is an invoice. We don't need an invoice, but uh, so I don't have a date on this thing, but I can look it up and put a little slip of paper in here so I don't forget. There are little slips of papers now in all of my finished copies because I don't get pub sheets for most of them anymore because they're sent from the warehouse. Publisher, publishers, publicists still aren't in their offices over a year later from when they left, sometimes in a hurry, sometimes precipitously. Sometimes they left work on a Friday afternoon and were told that Saturday in a group email that they couldn't go back to work on Monday. So they've got you know, shoes under their desk or, or uh, personal books of their own on their desk or stuff like that. And they haven't seen them in over a year. Uh, and that's what they would do. You know, they would put you on a mailing list, put put publicity sheets in books, send them out, that sort of thing. And they, that all has to be done remotely now. So, uh, but anyway, this is World War II history. More World War II history. Uh, this is Fortress Dark and Stern by Wendy Z. Goldman and Donald Filzer, the Soviet home front during World War II. Fortress Dark and Stern. Very nice. This is from the folks at Oxford University Press. Uh, so we don't have we don't have a pub sheet, but I can still tell you about it. What have we got here? After Hitler's invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941, German troops conquered the heartland of the Soviet industry and agriculture and turned the occupied territories into mass killing fields. The country's survival hung in the balance. Uh, in this book, the authors tell the epic tale of the Soviet home front during World War II. Against the backdrop of the Red Army's early retreats and hard-fought advances after Stalingrad, they present the impact of total war behind the front lines in a chronicle of spirited defense efforts, draconian state directives, teeming black markets, official corruption, and selfless heroism. In one of the greatest wartime feats in history, Soviet workers rapidly evacuated factories, food, and people thousands of miles to the east. After long, dangerous journeys and unheated boxcars, they built a new industrial base beyond the reach of German bombers. As the Soviet state reached the height of its power, imposing military discipline and sending millions of people to work thousands of miles from home, ordinary people withstood starvation, epidemics, and horrific living conditions to supply the front and make the Allied victory possible. This book examines the dark and painful war years from a new perspective, telling the stories of evacuees, refugees, teenage and women workers, runaways, from work, prisons, and deportees, uh, and it's a it's a, a aspect of the Russian side of World War II that I know a little better now than I did before because I've read uh, Sean McMeekin's book Stalin's War, which has a lot to do with this. They complement each other. I really hope that they don't get reviewed together because Stalin's War deserves a review of its own. It, 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 but book section editors often cannot resist the urge to review books together that are in any way similar, which is good, I guess, but it splits the focus. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. One, some of you probably like group reviews better because it gives you it puts more books on your radar. That might be true. That might be a good argument. One way or another, this, this is overlaps with a lot of Stalin's War. Uh, and it's, it sounds like it's going to be a little more academic, going to a little more detail about specific things that Stalin's war, of course, due to space, had to minimize. So that's great. Fantastic. So that, uh, what with Spectre of War and uh, Stalin's War and now Fortress Dark and Stern and a couple of books that are coming out next month, this is turning out to be a pretty good year for World War II history. Uh, so that's the mail. Fantastic mail haul. So we have a fo Fortress Dark and Stern. What was life like in the Soviet Union? during World War II. Uh, then we have uh, The Life She Wished to Live, A Life, Marjorie Keenan Rawlings. Uh, fantastic. Very glad to have a finished copy. We have Putting It Together, which is uh, one of the more overpraised bits from Sunday in the Park with George. But it's a whole book about the, the making and the marketing and the early days and the primary reception and all the people involved, the actors, the producers, the everything, of Sunday in the Park with George, which is a very, very famous 20th century musical. Uh, then we have Second Place by Rachel Cusk, uh, her latest Thin Wan novel. Uh, and uh, and finally, uh, Reflections of a Non-Political Man by Thomas Mann from the New York Review of Books. Uh, so in, a, in a, a new paperback edition of a book that otherwise you would have to prowl the brattle sale carts to find. Great. 
fantastic, perfect mixture of Broadway, which used to be a deep, abiding love of mine. Deep and abiding love. Spent a lot of time going to Broadway shows. Uh, but also World War II history, a biography, uh, made-up stories, and a great reprint. So a fantastic mail haul. Steve is well pleased. Uh, so that's it. That's the mail for today. Uh, Sunday. <laughs> There'll probably be more mail. I mean, the mail week starts up next week. So, But we, we can probably expect Sunday mail on a regular basis, at least until my UPS driver changes. Uh, so anyway, I'm going to wrap this up, but I've got plenty more to talk to you about. <laughs> so I'll be back. Thank you, Book Two.